This lesson covers the fundamentals of takeoff performance. There are five basic performance requirements to be considered when determining the maximum takeoff gross weight. The first requirement, the fuel length requirement, ensures that there is adequate runway available to safely continue or to reject a takeoff in the event of an engine failure and also ensures there is adequate runway for a normal all-engine takeoff. There are also minimum climb requirements from liftoff to the end of the takeoff flight path. These climb requirements ensure that the aircraft has sufficient climb capability in all phases of the takeoff. The obstacle clearance requirement ensures that the aircraft is able to clear all obstacles with the required margin. Another restriction on the maximum takeoff gross weight is the maximum certified tire speed. This restriction limits the maximum speed on the ground prior to takeoff. Similarly, the takeoff gross weight may also be limited by the maximum amount of energy which the brakes can absorb in the event of a rejected takeoff. Consider the following example where each of these five requirements has an associated maximum takeoff gross weight. In this specific 737-700 example, the climb limit weight is the most restrictive. Therefore, the actual takeoff weight of the airplane cannot be greater than this limiting weight. However, in the 747-400 example, the fuel limit weight is the most restrictive. Here again, the actual takeoff weight of the airplane cannot be greater than this limiting weight. Later in the lesson, after the coverage of these fundamental performance requirements, we'll look at some related topics. In particular, we will study improved climb, reduced thrust, and contaminated runways. To start, we'll study the field length takeoff performance requirements. Considering only the fuel length requirements, the maximum takeoff weight limit is restricted by three specific requirements that ensure the airplane has sufficient performance for the actual runway available. The first requirement addresses the ability to stop the airplane if an event occurs prior to the takeoff decision speed, V1, and the crew rejects the takeoff. For this case, it is assumed that maximum braking action is initiated at or before reaching the scheduled V1. At the maximum takeoff gross weight, the crew will be just able to stop the airplane within the available runway. The second requirement addresses the case where an engine failure occurs after the takeoff decision speed V1, and therefore braking action cannot be initiated at or before V1. In this case, the crew must be able to safely continue the takeoff. The third and final field length requirement addresses the normal all-engine takeoff. In this case, there must be an extra 15% margin of runway available over the actual takeoff distance. As mentioned already in this lesson, the takeoff requirements are dependent upon the airplane's speed relative to a predetermined takeoff decision speed, V1. This speed is selected such that if the first braking action can be initiated at or prior to the takeoff decision speed, then the crew will be able to reject the takeoff. However, if the first action to stop the airplane has not been initiated prior to the takeoff decision speed, V1, then the crew must continue the takeoff. Let's take a closer look at the distance required to continue the takeoff following an engine failure during the takeoff roll. We'll look at the case where the engine failure occurs too late to allow the crew to apply braking action at or before V1.
For the maximum takeoff gross weight, the actual runway available must be sufficient to allow the crew to continue the takeoff and the airplane reach a safe flying speed at 35 feet above the end of the runway. This minimum safe flying speed is called the takeoff safety speed, V2, which we'll look at more closely in the next lesson. The required height above the end of the runway, called the screen height, is 35 feet for a dry runway and 15 feet for a wet runway. In the one engine out case, the total distance from brake release to the point where the airplane is 35 feet above ground level is referred to as the one engine inoperative takeoff distance. There is a weight for which the actual runway length available equals the one engine inoperative takeoff distance. Now let's consider the case for which the airplane can be accelerated to the takeoff decision speed and stopped within the available runway. In this case, an event occurs early enough in the takeoff run that the crew can apply braking action at the takeoff decision speed V1. The event must occur prior to V1 to allow the crew to react and apply the brakes at V1. The FAA regulations account for one second of recognition and reaction time between the event and the crew's initial application of a braking action. The total runway required to accelerate to V1, apply braking without reverse thrust, and bring the airplane to a stop is called the accelerate stop distance. There is a weight for which the actual runway available equals the accelerate stop distance. The third fuel length requirement addresses the all engines operating takeoff. Remember that the takeoff distance is measured from brake release to the point where the airplane is 35 feet above the runway. For the all engine takeoff, the airplane speed at this point will be greater than the minimum safe flying speed, V2. The requirement states that the available runway must be at least 15% greater than the all engine takeoff distance. There is a weight for which the actual runway length available equals the required distance for the all engine takeoff. The fuel length limited takeoff gross weight is the most restrictive of the engine out accelerate stop distance limited weight, the engine out takeoff distance limited weight, and the all engine takeoff distance limited weight. Note that for a given takeoff gross weight with a selected V1, there is a minimum required runway length equal to the longest of the accelerate stop distance, the engine out takeoff distance, and the all engine takeoff distance. This is called the FAR field length. For a moment, let's consider two cases in more detail. The two cases are the rejected takeoff with braking initiated at V1 and the continued takeoff with an engine failure at the most critical speed, VEF. Our goal is to determine the minimum field length required. As you'll see, the required fuel length depends heavily upon the selection of the takeoff decision speed, V1. If the airplane loses an engine at a very low V1, the crew can stop the airplane within a short amount of runway, but would require considerably more runway to accelerate to the minimum safe flying speed, V2. At this V1, the required fuel length is the engine out takeoff distance. On the other hand, with a high takeoff decision speed, the crew could complete the acceleration to V2 within a relatively short distance, but would require much more runway to come to a stop. Therefore, at this V1, the required fuel length is the accelerate stop distance. The green line shows how the engine out takeoff distance changes with V1. The red line shows how the accelerate stop distance changes with V1. And the yellow line indicates the required field length.
So at this takeoff weight, the absolute minimum required field length occurs at the intersection of the accelerate stop and the engine out takeoff distance lines. This is called the balanced field length and the corresponding V1 is called the balanced V1. Notice that for the minimum required fuel length, the accelerate stop distance and engine out takeoff distance are equal. This lesson will discuss the adjustments made to runway length to account for the fact that some of the runway length is used as the airplane is aligned on the runway prior to beginning the takeoff roll. These adjustments are referred to as lineup corrections or lineup allowances. Lineup corrections may be made when computing takeoff performance anytime the access to the runway does not permit positioning of the airplane at the runway threshold. For example, runways that require a 90 degree turn on may require a lineup adjustment. However, no adjustments are required when the airplane can be aligned with the center line at the runway threshold. This could occur on runways with ample turning aprons. Accounting for runway lineup distances will reduce the available runway length and the field length limit takeoff weight. The actual runway length is reduced by the distance required to align the airplane on the center line of the runway. The minimum lineup allowances assume that the airplane is positioned as closely as possible to the runway threshold. During positioning, the airplane's landing gear may never be closer to the edge of the runway than the minimum edge safety distance. The minimum edge safety distance is 10 feet for 727 and 737 aircraft, and for other Boeing aircraft, it is 15 feet. The adjustment to the takeoff distance available is made separately from the adjustment to the accelerate stop distance available. The lineup adjustment to the takeoff distance available is the distance from the main gear to the runway threshold because the end of the FAR field length is marked where the main landing gear are 35 feet above the runway surface. On the other hand, the accelerate stop distance adjustment is the distance from the nose gear to the runway threshold because the airplane must come to a complete stop with the nose gear still on the runway. Operators can minimize the impact of runway alignment accountability by using separate takeoff distance and accelerate stop distance adjustments. JAA operators are required to account for any necessary lineup adjustments. When determining a runway lineup allowance, the characteristics for each airplane model should be used. There is a chart for the actual values available for each airplane in the takeoff safety training aid.